Last thing I have to say is um, thank you so much to Patrizia for um, giving up her time to um, give us this brilliant event. So thank you, Patrizia. Thanks, and thanks everyone for coming here. Um, so um, for those who haven't met me before, my name is Patrizia Settola. I'm Italian, so I apologize for my accent. I hope we will understand me anyway. Um, and the presentation I'm going to give this evening is based on a paper that I presented at, a, at the launch of a conference uh, with the launch of a Center for Human Animal Studies in the UK in October. And there are just two things that I want to stress before I start. So first of all, it is philosophy, I'm afraid. <laughs> so I won't hold it against you if you fall asleep uh, halfway through it. But I would rather if uh, at any time, if there is something that is not clear, you stop me and interrupt me uh, and ask me. And the second thing is, I'm only a PhD student, <laughs> so um, this is very much work in progress. So the title is, do they matter because we care, or do we care because they matter? And I hope the reason for choosing this title will become clear as I go through uh, the presentation. So, the paper was inspired by reading a recent article by a philosopher called Todd May. Um, and I will follow many of his distinctions. So, I thought I would put a, a summary here of these distinctions to start with, so that hopefully they will uh, make sense. I will go through his arguments, some of uh, which I agree with and some of which I don't. So, uh, the first thing uh, is um, that Todd May identifies at least two separate and for him irreducible uh, grounds for moral concern. What he calls CBRs or capacity based reasons on the one hand and RBRs or relationship based reasons on the other. He also considers but quickly rejects the third uh, possible ground for moral concern which is just being human, and hopefully this will become uh, clear as soon as I go uh, along. In terms of the people, the philosophers, who um, focus on one or the other types of moral reasons, uh, the focus uh, of the moral individualists is on capacity-based reasons. I'm sure you're all familiar with the, at least some of these. Gary Francion, uh, um, Tom Reagan, Peter Singer, McMahon, etc. are all categorized as moral individualists. On the other hand, those philosophers who are focusing mostly on relationships are called by Todd May relationalists. And he makes a further distinction between assistance relationalists on the one hand and Wittgenstein relationalists on the other. And uh, Wittgensteinian are so called because they follow the philosophy of uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein. And he particularly focuses on two women philosophers in, um, uh, in this area, Cora Damon and Alice Craig. So, the two main distinct grounds for uh, moral status that he identifies are capacities and uh, relations. So, According to the capacity approach, it is the individual characteristics of individual beings that determine their moral status. On the other hand, for the relation-based approach, it is the relations with human beings that confer moral status. And if uh, you look uh, in the past, capacities have variously included logos or language reason, having sex with pleasure, starting wars, being autonomous agents, etc. Notice a pattern there. These are all capacities that have been historically ascribed to humans only, showing that this approach, the capacities approach, was developed originally in order to justify human exceptionalism, which is the idea that human beings are the only appropriate objects for moral concern. With empirical investigations, it has been increasingly shown that animals too display many uh, capacities which were only um, considered the exclusive realm of human beings in the past. But the challenge to this idea of human exceptionalism does not only come from science or empirical research, but also from philosophy, as we will see. So, in animal uh, ethics, 
the capacity approach has been adopted by moral individualists. As I mentioned before, these include Peter Singer, Tom Reagan, Gary Francion, Jeff Meckham, Mark, Mark Mann, sorry, and others. And in this case, the capacities involved are being sentience, this is true for Singer, Francion, etc., consciousness, being subject of a life, Tom Reagan, and so on. And from now on, I will refer to these capacity-based reasons are CBRs. So they are a reason to give moral consideration to a being in virtue of some capacity possessed by that being. And these capacities can be different from philosopher to philosopher. On the other hand, um, May labels as relationalists uh, those philosophers who believe that it is the relations that an animal has with human beings that determine their moral status. And from now on, I will refer to these relation-based reasons are, as RBRs. So, RBRs, relation-based reasons, are moral obligations towards a being in virtue of that being either belonging to a moral community or having some relationship with that moral community. And uh, Todd May defines a human moral community as a community of interdependent individuals with a set of moral obligations to one another which arise from their dependencies and interactions. Just one thing to note is that condition A is much stronger than condition B, belonging to a moral community. And in fact, several philosophers have argued that no animals cannot, uh, can meet it because they cannot truly participate in a moral community. This objection is in itself controversial, I'm not going to go into it now. It can be argued against, however, even if it was conceded as true, uh, the weaker condition B would still apply. So nobody can um, argue against the idea that animals have some relationship with a moral community. So the uh, um, further distinction that may uh, make sense is between uh, Wittgensteinian relationalists and assistance uh, relationalists. Specific to the Wittgensteinian, uh, particularly Cora Diamond and Alice Gray, is the claim that our moral relations to non-human animals are derivative from our moral relations with other human beings. Okay, so animals matter morally based on the fact that other human beings matter morally, first of all. And in fact, being human for them is in itself a morally relevant category. Relations are also important for the assistance relationalists, and for them, an animal's claim of assistance depends on that animal's relationship with human beings. What this means is that we have a moral obligation to help an animal in need based on our relationship with that animal. However, animals also have a claim of non-harm or non-interference even in absence of a relationship. Okay, so the, this distinction is often also <coughs> labeled as positive duties towards negative duties. So we have negative duties towards all animals not to harm them, but we have added positive duties to assist animals based on our relationships with them. This is what the assistance relation would claim. And May, uh, Todd May uh, discusses in his paper at length uh, the position of these assistance relationalists. However, for the purpose of this presentation, I will focus on the Wittgenstein only, Cora Diamond and Alice Perry. But if you're interested on the assistance part, you can ask during the Q&A. So, going back to the first set of moral reasons, capacities. Here is just a quotation from uh, the uh, paper by Todd May, and it's just to give an idea of his view. I will read out. In some circumstances, humans and animals with comparable capacities, say for instance a captive chimpanzee and a severely cognitively impaired child, should be considered equally. My claim is that there is a lot wrong with this uh, claim. And uh, first of all, there are non-trivial difficulties involved in defining, assessing, and comparing cognitive abilities across different species. 
For example, chimpanzees have consistently shown better short-term memory than university students. This uh, is from the results of empirical research uh, from 2007. And something more recent, from 2014, they are better than humans at tactical games. And in fact, if it works here, I just have a little clip for those who haven't seen it to show how good uh, the, the short-term memory of chimpanzees is. So first you'd think they used just one very smart chip. They actually had six chips taking the test. And if you want to see more of this, go to ecnews.com. We have a lot of video of chips. Of course they also have they always have to trivialize everything by saying something silly at the end. But this is just to see uh, to show that um, uh, even the, in, in, in terms of facts, this comparison between the chimp and the cognitively disabled child doesn't make any sense. I love the way the chip was coming around. This is easy. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even more importantly, the choice of comparing a chimp with a cognitively impaired child reiterates a tradition in analytic philosophy opposing false dilemmas, setting up an artificial, impossible scenario of conflict. Mm. And I think even more importantly, the, the whole focus on cognitive capacities is misleading. While one needs to take into account an individual's specific abilities in order to treat them appropriately, cognitive abilities do not need to be a criterion for establishing the moral status of that creature in the first place. So, why would May think that that is the case instead? And it is because he appeals to a common sense view which the Grazi calls the sliding scale model of moral status. According to this view, there is a hierarchy of beings, with the beings at the top of the scale, of course, human beings, deserving the highest moral consideration, followed by higher mammals like chimps and dolphins, while as one moves down the scale, the amount of consideration owed to lower beings decreases. In other words, Quoting, animals deserve consideration in proportion to their cognitive, emotional, and social complexity. And it is in line with this view, for example, I don't know if you're aware, Stephen Wise has recently proposed to extend personal to chimps and other mammals, and this is a current legal case which is being um, debated in the US. The alternative view to this sliding scale model of moral status, which has been proposed among others by Peter Singer, is that of equal consideration. If cognitive abilities are irrelevant, all the beings who are morally relevant deserve equal moral consideration. And it is hard to justify this sliding scale model as preferable to equal consideration. So, that was on capacities. What about relations? Some philosophers deny the relevance of relations in morality altogether. 
because they think that allowing relations to ground ethics would amount to renouncing to the principle of impartiality and running the risk of justifying forms of discrimination such as racism or sexism. However, May invokes two reasons whereby relational bonds are relevant to the moral status of animals. The first reason comes from the analogy with human relationships, in the same way that I have reasons to be more concerned for the well-being of a family member or a friend compared to a stranger, I may also have more reasons for concern for an animal for whom I am otherwise responsible compared to an unknown one. And I think this has a very strong intuitive appeal. If I, I have animals who share my uh, house and I strongly feel that I have <laughs> a very strong uh, responsibility towards them in terms of feeding them and giving them veterinary care, etc., compared to others for whom I'm not responsible. And the second reason has to do with the fact that by bringing animals within the human community, we have created a dependency in them, particularly as a result of domestication and selective breeding, which they would not have had in the first place. When we make others so dependent on us, for May, we also create obligations towards them, or at least additional reasons for being concerned about their well-being. This point has been interpreted by some as meaning, for instance, that we have a duty to assist domesticated animals, but not wild animals. However, I contend that when we appropriate an environment for our own purposes, we become responsible for the fate of the other beings who originally inhabited that environment. We are, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, an example of this scenario, for example, the consequences on wildlife of the ongoing deforestation of Borneo for the production of palm oil. So, just to clarify a bit better what uh, May's views are on the importance of, of, of relations uh, and animals, he gives the example of two cats, one domestic, one feral, and he says, on the basis of their capacities alone, we have a negative duty not to harm either of them, or not to interfere with either of them. He also thinks that based on their capacities alone, we have reasons to assist both. But we have a stronger reason to feed the one that we are responsible for, to give veterinary care to the one that we are directly responsible for compared to the other, based on those relation-based reasons. Okay, so they give extra moral reasons. The second example is that of chimps again. So on the left hand side is a captive chimp and um, on the right hand side a um, wild one. So remember the example we gave before about the comparison between the child and the captive chimp. And in that case, he thought the captive chimp and the child had equal consideration because they were both within human community. So revisiting that example, if um, the child was part of society, and whereas the chimp was in the wild, according to May, while they make similar moral claims based on their capacities, the relationship-based reasons differ in the two cases, since to bring someone into a society means to acquire responsibility towards them that one would not have otherwise. I already expressed my disagreement with this kind of comparison earlier, but here I would like to add that I think we also acquire relationship-based reasons towards a wild gene whenever we destroy their habitat. So, not only we should not interfere or harm them, but we should also assist them when we interfere with their habitat. And also, I'm just wondering about this example, if I'm slightly uncomfortable, because we're kind of actually talking about domestication, which actually we cause it. You know, it's not like kind of dogs or cats, which kind of, you know, half. Uh, it's not you even know, domestication, it's, yeah, but that's it's I'm captivity. Saying, the captivity yeah. basically sure. equal yeah. almost like, in my understanding, relations, you know, and yes. I kind of I feel very uncomfortable absolutely. about it. Yeah, you know, I just so absolutely you share. To imprison yeah. somebody yes. in order to feel um, yes. responsibility yes. towards them. And exactly. Kind of, you yeah. know, so. 
Yes. Does it work here, kind of, with the same, like with the cut, I understand, with the chimp, I'm a little bit... Yes, I, I, I totally... Uh, Does it make, kind of, the case stronger, you know, kind of... Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think there is an element of similarity, because, in a sense, you could, uh, um, as, for example, Nybert does, question the mystication itself. Mm -hmm. And so the idea would be, well, for those who now we have as domestic animals, we have to look after them. Okay. And the same thing here, is okay. here. <laughs> but uh, yes, mm -hmm. I, I was thinking the same when I was reading this. Thank you. Okay. Um, so these are the two main grounds for more concern. So we have capacities on the one hand, and my view is cognitive abilities are irrelevant for moral status, we have relation, relations on the other, I think relations are relevant for moral status, and then there is a third ground for moral concern that is the category of being human, and this is particularly emphasized by the Wittgenstein, Cora Diamond and Alice Perry. So for the Wittgenstein, our moral obligations uh, towards one another do not depend on any characteristics possessed by individuals individual animals or humans, or on our relations to them, but rather derive from participating in a human way of living. For Diamond, being human is a morally relevant category which is not grounded in biology. It is not a matter of species membership, but rather of the imagination. We have an image of what it is to lead a human life, and this image is and should be for her the ground for moral evaluation. Well, our relations to one another are based on this imaginative sense of having a human life to lead. I think this is quite difficult to grasp, but I'll give you an example that might, might help to, to understand it. For example, in Diamond's view, this idea that it is important to have an idea of what it is to have a human life to lead makes sense of uh, the fact that we become morally outraged when we see someone being made fun of, even if the person who is made fun of has no understanding of what is going on. Because obviously here there is no capacity at work. Okay, so it is obviously something to do, this moral outrage can only be understood in terms of an affront to human dignity. And this concept of human dignity obviously derives from knowing what it is that matters in terms of having a human life. Diamond is willing to extend our moral consideration to animals, appealing to the web of relationships of human beings with one another and with other animals. However, for her, our moral consideration of animals is always an extension of our response to other human beings and requires an imaginative leap. Quoting her, uh, the response to animals as our fellows in mortality, in life on this earth, depends on a conception of human life. It is an extension of a non-biological uh, notion of what human life is. So, by emphasizing the primacy of our relations to other animals in the context of our practices, Diamond derives our moral obligation to other animals as an extension of the moral consideration we have of other human beings in virtue of being human, of knowing what it means to lead a human life. The problem I have with this is why this idea that our response always has to be an extension, why can it not be direct? So why does it have to derive from having an image of a human life to lead and projecting this image onto non-human animals? Maybe it is, in some cases, for some people who are removed from other creatures, sorry, <laughs> of course I get them. Um, but for anyone who has had access to non-human animals, there is an immediate recognition of the other as other, and at the same time as a locus of sentence. So uh, this is some, somewhere where I have disagreement with them. Uh, with more diamond. So, um, quoting her again, she says, images of fellow creatures are naturally much less compelling ones than images of our fellow human beings. 
can be. Again, I see a problem with this. Why should these images be much less compelling? Are they really? Why naturally? And for whom are they so? I'm sure that for nobody in this room, this is the case. Okay, so the second Wittgenstein uh, philosopher that uh, May talks about is Alice Crary. And she takes a lot from Cora Diamond, including this idea of the importance of uh, having a, an image of what it means to uh, have a human life to lead. And quoting her, she says, there is a straightforward sense in which the recognition that a creature is a human being or an animal is by itself morally significant. So for Cora Diamond, being human is a morally significant category in itself. For Alice Crary, being an animal is a morally significant category. So you do not look at a creature and see if they have certain capacities, if they tick the box, mm -hmm. <laughs> then they are morally significant. No, just because they are an animal, they are already morally significant. So, um, and also she says, our ability to identify human beings' qualities of mind depends on our already having a certain ethical orientation towards her. This means that when we interact with another human being, our ethical concern is already part of our recognition of her being human in a pre-reflective manner. So you don't see something, someone, as a neutral container and then you add the ethical orientation on top of it. It is part already of your notion of that other being when you encounter them. So this ethical orientation, for example, allows us to recognize aspects of the others to which we would otherwise be blind. For example, we can, at least sometimes, directly take in uh, that another human being or an animal is in pain. When we think or talk about pain, we do so in terms of categories which are, and I quote, normatively, normatively non-neutral, in the sense that the idea of the appropriateness of particular modes of response is internal to them. So when you perceive another being in, uh, in pain, you do so directly, first of all, and perceiving pain is a non-neutral category from a moral standpoint, because there is already a sense of what the appropriate response to that should be. And in fact, um, Crary um, talks about um, Wittgenstein here, who describes what it is to relate to another as minded, so as having a mind, as a matter of having not some opinion or belief, but rather a certain attitude, what he calls an attitude towards a soul. Obviously here soul doesn't have a religious meaning, uh, but simply the idea of relating to the other as someone who matters morally. So in relation to animals, this means that it is our recognition of them as beings capable of flourishing that allows us to make sense of their behavioral expressions and grounds our relationship with them. Thus, in contrast with the moral individualist, her claim is that animals as such are worthy of respect and attention. So this category of animality, of being an animal, plays for Alice Crary the same role as being human does for Diamond. Namely, it is a more morally significant category uh, per se. So Todd May then uh, proceeds to criticize both Diamond and Crary. And the first difficulty that he identifies is what he calls the instability of the notion of kind. He asks, what is the kind which is worthy of particular concern? That of dogs, the broader one of pets, or the general kind of animals? However, this criticism may apply to Cora Diamond, but not to Alice Perry, because we've just seen that for her, Animality is a morally significant category. The second aspect that he identifies is that um, as empirical investigation increasingly reveals complexity in the lives of non-human animals, these discovered capacities should become grounds for concern as capacity-based reasons. So the more we know about animals, 
the more we should question the practices regarding them. I would contend that while the discovery of complexity may motivate a change in people's ethical orientation towards animals, however, it does not qualify as a moral reason. Okay, so cognitive abilities are not relevant. And the third aspect it may criticize is, is the fact that both Diamond's and Crary's views seem to entail that what different kinds of animals deserve is based on our current practices and engagement with them. Yet we cannot use these very practices as the source of our moral obligation towards animals. In fact, such necessity ultimately involves changing the way we see animals and pre-reflectively engage with them. And I think here it's right, there is a need to move away from current practices, but I am not sure that uh, Crary in particular doesn't have the resources to account for that. Can you explain what you mean by pre-reflexively engaged with them? Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> um, but what I mean here is uh, when you encounter them and perceive them uh, before applying any rational um, judgment, if that makes sense. Um, so my own view on Diamond and Cray, I think that they are both right in rejecting capacity as grounds for moral concern. So they don't want to see the other human or animal as a neutral receptacle with just suffering in it as a, an extra add-on. However, I think that they're resorting to being human as a moral significant, significant category is uh, not uh, necessary. I also think that both Diamond and Prey correctly identify the origin of our ethical response in our shared vulnerability and the recognition of the other as fellow creature. Uh, however, as I mentioned before, I think that this recognition can happen directly. It does not have to be always an extension or a derivation of having an image of a human life to lead and projecting this image onto non-human animals. And now I will try to give an account of this non-mediated connection between ethical orientation and the recognition of a sentence based on a definition of sentence not in terms of a capacity but uh, of a shared vulnerability infinitude and also a certain approach to empathy. So first of all, sentence revisited. So um, I think that Beings are morally significant in virtue of their shared vulnerability, their ability to have positive and negative experiences. They're having a life that can go bad or well for them. Uh, in fact, sentence, in accordance with several philosophers, including Heidegger and Derrida, can be seen as a passivity, a vulnerability, rather than a capacity. I call it a mode of being, if mm -hmm. it makes any sense. If being sentient is sufficient for moral status, Capacity-based reasons are reduced to the recognition of this mode of being in another. And it is only to those beings who are recognized as sentient that we can apply also the relationship-based reasons. Even though implicitly, this is also acknowledged by those who reject the capacity-based approach. What many do not accept is that sentience is in itself sufficient for moral consideration. For Diamond, for instance, the felt, visceral recognition of the shared finitude, vulnerability and suffering of our fellow creatures is and should be at the heart of our response to them. Now, R&D is a mode of being that distinguishes animals from plants and inanimate objects, so the very fact that she chooses to concentrate exclusively on other animals rather than, say, living beings in general, shows that she is using sentience as an implicit criterion for carving out those beings who are worth a moral response from those who may not be. So even though she never makes the uh, explicit reference to sentence, I think she is actually taking it into account. So I think for this reason that the use of the term capacity is misleading when referred to, referring to sentence, uh, it is better conceived uh, as a mode of being. And from now on, I will refer to sentence as having this meaning. So the second 
aspect is that of the empathetic response. And uh, in particular, there is uh, an approach to the empathetic response uh, held by a human philosopher called Green Painter, who is in the phen phenomenological um, area of, uh, of philosophy. And uh, for her, empathy is the acknowledgement of another consciousness based on uh, the theories of another two philosophers, Husserl and Edith Stein. And I thought that this approach is compatible with, compatible with and also provides substance to that concept of appropriate ethical orientation that I mentioned earlier. So, um, she starts with uh, this uh, idea of animals by Husserl as soul-bearing, embodied, moving, sensing, psychic, intentional, and conscious beings who relate to the world in a meaningful way. And I'm sure that as you read this, for you this makes perfect sense and it is the way we all um, see animals. However, this is not the way animals have been traditionally seen uh, in, in philosophy. Um, mostly they are Cartesian machines, uh, just, you know, just mechanisms with n not even um, feelings or sensations. Um, and the personalistic attitude, again this is another concept by Husserl, is the way in which we live with one, one another or are related to one another in love and aversion, in disposition and action. And this personalistic attitude, according to Painter, is a pre-reflective way in which beings experience their environment and establish relationships based on concern and care. It is the basic original attitude upon which all abstract reflection is grounded. And according to Painter, it is shared by non-human animals. As it is hard to conceive how the objects of an animal's environment may not be meaningful to the animal. And also, uh, secondly, it allows acts of mutual understanding. And on the basis of these two views of animals and the personalistic attitude which is shared by non-human animals, Peter goes on to say that the foundation of moral subjectivity is in our animal nature. And in support of her argument that our animal nature is the foundation of moral subjectivity, she turns then to an approach um, to the understanding of empathy that was put forward by a philosopher called Edith Stein. And the question that arises from a painter is, how do we know that we are in the presence of another consciousness? And here, there is one theory, which is called the inferential analogical theory, whereby you know that you have consciousness, uh, other beings look similar enough to you, so you infer from analogy that they may have consciousness too. However, this account does not seem to stand to scrutiny. Uh, for example, there is a philosophy, philosopher called Dan Zahavi who says, even in my experience of myself, I never infer the existence of my body from my psyche or vice versa. I rather experience a unified whole from the start. And so this is true also for others. So she, Painter, proposes an alternative uh, to the inferential analogical theory. So the key that allows access to another psychic life is empathy which uh, constitutes a fundamental mode of intersubjective cross-species relation. Empathy, according to her, is the basis for all intersubjective experiences. Far from being irrational, it is a form of knowledge of foreign consciousness, including that of non-human animals. For painter empathy, which can only occur between beings with the psychic lives of sentient beings, determines which beings should be included in justice. As empathizing agents, when we open to the reality of others with their needs and desires, we cannot treat them anymore as mere things, in a personal sense, even before the moral sense. As empathic patients, animals become subjects of moral concern. Moral subjectivity, therefore, lies in animal consciousness, in empathic patience, being a, a, a patient, um, rather than in human consciousness or empathic agency. The other that I access as a psychic being makes moral demands on me. So, I just... Sure. 
we just need more time and more and more to be clear Sorry? on that. There is so much and I'm very confused. I'm almost finished. <laughs> no, 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 I just want yeah. to find it. No, maybe we'll later we can really yeah. Yeah. come back to the sure. empathy and kind of like reflexi reflexive sort of a, a perception and yet I have that. Uh, yes, okay, okay. yeah, okay. We'll do. Uh, so here I just uh, um, wanted to make a parallel between the empathetic response in Korean painter that we've just seen and what Alice Prairie called the ethical orientation. And I find that there is a lot in common between the two. Painter says there is an appropriate affective response to another consciousness, and this is empathy. Okay? So when I am uh, faced with another being, who is sentient, um, my appropriate reasonable response to that being is with empathy. And Freddy says, our perception of other humans and animals is affected, imbued with value from the start. Painter says that empathy is a form of knowledge. It helps seeing aspects of the other which we would not see otherwise. And similarly, Prairie says, it allows us to illuminate aspects of the others to which we would otherwise be blind. So I thought that was interesting. So, affective perception, so perception of the other already with value and empathy, both are a form of knowledge of the other. How, how is the kind of... You're saying how that can be grounded in the animal nature and the affective. Where are they getting that idea from exactly? Is it because it's a kind of pre pre vocal kind of Yeah, pre language, pre yeah. reflective, yes. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um this is maybe this is my, again, my own uh, attempt of closing the gap between the moral individualists on the one hand, Singer and Reagan, for example, and Wittgenstein is like Dan and Crary. So, um, Singer and Reagan reject the need for emotional involvement in our ethical response, yet they both acknowledge that the animal makes a moral claim in, in virtue of their suffering. And they Therefore, say there is an appropriate moral response to the suffering of the other. On the other hand, we have a certain ethical orientation which precedes the attribution of capacities. So you relate to the other already as someone who has value. But Daniel says there is nothing in the suffering of the other per se to which we ought to respond. But we do rightly respond to the shared vulnerability, finitude, etc., of fellow creatures. So, what I, I think that both sides are perpetuating from opposite directions a dichotomy between feeling and reason that needs overcoming. Singer and Reagan are preoccupied with giving animal ethics a rational foundation, which is immune to the accusations of sentimentalism. Diamond, on her part, wants to emphasize that there are no capacities that we ought to respond to in an ethical manner. Suffering in itself is no moral pull on us. But most, both camps may be missing something important, whose recognition might render their positions closer than they would be prepared to admit. Namely, that sentience, defined broadly as a vulnerability, a passivity, an openness to the possibility of both positive experiences and suffering during this finite embodied life, is not so much a capacity, but an essential mode of being that calls the ethical orientation, the ethical response. And the recognition of this shared mode of being in others calls for an appropriate response, which is one of concern of lo or loving attention, which as both Painter and Crary suggest, using different terms, allows us to access and illuminate aspects of the other to which we would otherwise remain blind. So this is a modified version of the distinction between moral reason, the reasons that Todd May uh, offered. So my view is that we don't need capacity-based reasons. We can reduce them to sentient-based reasons. And then on top of those, we have the relations-based <coughs> reasons.
So there are degrees of empathetic response or ethical orientation depending on our relationships. At the same time, one also needs to recognize that those we do not have relationships with may still make moral demands on us simply in virtue of their sentience as a model being. And I think, yeah. So here I've identified some problems that are still open in my attempt of giving an account. So for Prairie, so for Singer and Reagan on the one hand, uh, they don't care about dignity or how we should relate to a dead animal. While Diamond and Prairie do, and uh, they are capable of giving an account uh, for, for this, the fact that we have concern for the dignity of an animal and for the corpse of an animal. Um, and so these are uh, open problems that I identified in my own account. And also one thing that I'm, uh, I think I'm starting to think about is if certain ethical orientation is the appropriate response to another, one can consider lack of this response as a defect of character. Obviously though, this wouldn't have to be seen as an individual prejudice because it's obviously inculcated through socialization. So there are a lot of factors um, at play here. But this is all. Thank you very much. And I hope you have some questions.